uh, one way of handling cancer, uh, the way I learned it is very learned about it was was very interesting. When I was traveling in China, I found out that uh, there was a case in a very remote area in China, and the kid was a seven-year-old kid with uh, osteosarcoma in the hip. And uh, as we know, there's really not very good treatment for it. Uh, and uh, sadly, this is in a very remote area. And uh, they, so, you know, uh, the, the kid was destined uh, for a very uh, ill fate. So, uh, in desperation, uh, the family found a doctor. We turned out to be a retired doctor from the army who's really an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> and, um, of course, as we know, re hip replacement is not a dime a dozen, you know, these operations are done so successfully nowadays is, is really an easy thing to do, you know. Uh, and this orthopedic surgeon decided to do something that's literally groundbreaking. And this is a story uh, that's not published or anything. And I heard, when I heard about it, I went in and talked to this guy to, and taught and interviewed the, the kid. It's just incredible. What he did was he took the hip out of this kid, the hip, just like a hip replacement. And he threw the hip into a pot of boiling water and he cooked the hip. And after much cooking, uh, he actually dried the hip and he put the hip back in, just like a hip replacement. So in, in, instead of replacing it with a piece of prosthesis, he's replacing it with a piece of cooked hip. No big deal, it's perfect fit because how can you find a better fit? And uh, guess what, he, of course he drew some bone marrow from the other hip and stuck the marrow into the center of this prosthesis, you know, the cooked hip. And the kid lived, there's no cancer, and today the kid is still alive. So it prompted me to, into a very interesting therapy called hyperthermia treatment. Anyways, when I traveled to Japan, I found out there was a Dr. Niwa, who has a wonderful hospital that does nothing but alternative cancer treatment uh, in the southern part of, uh, of Japan. And one of the treatments that he mandated his patient do, patients do is to bury themselves in a pot of hot sand once a day for eight minutes. And it's so hot that when I was buried in there for eight minutes, my, heart, my, my whole body was throbbing. So I said, if this is not going to cook the cancer, what is going to? Of course, if I, I was ready to import some of this magical sand that can retain the heat uh, to Vancouver, but I thought the health department might not like it because I was just about to do what I didn't want to do when I was buried in the hot sand pit, you know. So I said, gee, what am I supposed to do? And wonderfully, I came across something called peat hyperthermia therapy that I can use some peat preparation because, as we know, peat has a very high molecular weight and it's a carbon complex that's made from hundreds of, or 40, at least 40,000 years of fermenta fermentation of vegetation from the center of the earth um, that can absorb the heat very efficiently and release the heat very slowly to basically cook whatever's in the, in the heat. You know, that's how come you can have a fire in a bog and you can never put it out because of the high efficiency of storing the heat. Anyway, so what, what I've done nowadays, incorporated in the cancer treatment, is to make patients go through this peat bath therapy. Uh, so I built a whole bunch of uh, four uh, uh, seven-foot bathtubs, and uh, I'll get the staff to adjust the bath temperature so that it's at 110 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very hot. And uh, usually when you step into a bath water that hot, you're going to get scorched. Uh, so when we mix this peat material into the bath uh, uh, water, when patients step in, there's no problem as long as they stay still. You know, of course, someone has to be there to monitor their heart rate very carefully. As soon as their heart rate reaches 120, we'll pull them out and we'll, you know, uh, wrap them up so that they can they can rest. And of course, because of the raising of the uh, core temperature, uh, I know because they will sweat profusely for literally anything from half an hour to sometimes up to two hours. And uh, I know that I can raise the core body temperature up to at least 39 and sometimes 39.5 or 39.8, pushing it for the strong guys who manage to raise it to 40 degrees uh, Celsius, which is very traumatic. And uh, we know that heat can induce the white blood cells in our body to produce a 
uh, protein called heat shock protein, especially heat shock protein 46. We know that this is very instrumental in attacking, helping our immune system attack the cancer cells. And uh, so this is a therapy uh, that we do uh, in our, um, our, um, our clinic in coupling with that. We also do excorporal in the alpha and the one uh, natural killer cell activation. So what we do is while the patient is being heated up in an infrared chamber, uh, we will do phlebotomy and let out 200 cc's of blood. We will mix this blood with alpha and the uh, and the blood is infused back into the person. Uh, while the person is undergoing this hyperthermia treatment, of course, may, the core body temperature might not rise as drastically as the uh, peat hyperthermia therapy. And of course, in our, our clinic, we also do photo-oxidation, ultraviolet light therapy. I use a unit that I brought over from China uh, that uh, the ultraviolet light source literally heats up to about 300 degrees Celsius. Of course, we're going to need all kinds of fans blowing on the blood bag to make sure we don't cook the blood. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we have an ozone flow by uh, to uh, 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 ozonate the blood continuously for 15 minutes. We, we, we have uh, treated a number of non-Hodgkin cases uh, quite successfully uh, without chemotherapy. I wouldn't say I would use that as a primary treatment uh, for you know, uh, a lot of non-Hodgkin cases, but when uh, the odd case, when we see fit to put them through a course of treatment, we have seen uh, very obvious reduction of the uh, uh, size of the lymph nodes. Um, anyways, other than that, of course, we do uh, your uh, ozone uh, treatment, including direct injection of ozone. Uh, if it's necessary, of course, it's kind of scary. Uh, and we also do rectal, rectal insufflation, we do ozone steam sauna, and uh, we also uh, do uh, uh, IV ozone therapy, meaning uh, we mix the ozone direct, you know, we mix the ozone in the blood in a bottle and we infuse that back into the, into the person. Uh, so, but then again, there's no cookbook approach. What we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take a very thorough history, review all of the clinical evidence and records, and uh, uh, and go ahead and do a very thorough survey uh, and investigation uh, in terms of what the immune system is like, what kind of what kind of terrain we are we talking about, what kind of possible uh, causative agent can we identify, uh, you know, uh, to um, go ahead and make a decision in terms of what our strategy might be and go ahead and prioritize very carefully whether we need to attack, support, or uh, which needs to come first uh, in order to uh, lay down the program for the patient uh, and uh, hope for the best. And uh, of course, without uh, closing our mind entirely to some of the more drastic uh, conventional treatments, we could really uh, be part of our alternative treatment, you know, or whether we be complementary or they be complementary, I think it's a matter of uh, what we want to call it and uh, make it uh, to be the best uh, uh, in the patient's uh, 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 favor.